Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jeff Tabor. I'm the executive director for Enroute Care EMS LLC. We are the, the local uh, exclusive EMS provider for the city of Little Rock. And uh, today, uh, our, our presentation to you is a public education uh, program that we hope to partner with your agency to provide uh, your agency and its officers training uh, for hemorrhage control from extremity lacerations and bleeding, um, as well as uh, CPR and AED usage for cardiac arrest patients. The handouts that you see will go along with the slides with some additional details, and please, by all means, at any time, uh, ask any questions that you may have, and there'll be time afterwards uh, to expound upon anything that may not be as clear for you in this presentation. So, EMS public education, developing the first first responders. That's key, the first first responders. So what is a first first responder? As you can see here, in its simplest form, everyone is a first first responder. The lay persons, the average citizen, uh, man and woman and child out in the public, uh, police officers, anyone uh, who is first to the patient, the injured or the ill, is the first first responder. Most often we, we typically probably think fire or EMS and what we offer as the first responders for medical and trauma patients. But again, it's important to understand that there are first first responders and it is very key that they make a huge impact on the patient's survivability and outcomes. Law enforcement officers who provide point of injury care is fairly new to our nation, um, especially to our city. It's following um, the, a military trend that, that has made its way to, to the civilian side. Um, and as you can see here, the ability to aid in the immediate need can help decrease preventable deaths. That's what we're talking about, preventable deaths as it pertains to hemorrhage control. If I could ask you how many preventable deaths would you say are okay? I think your answer is probably zero. There should be zero preventable deaths. They're preventable, right? It is laying the hands on these patients that can make them preventable. Look right here, read this quote, word for word. The fate of the wounded rests in the hands of the one who applies the first dressing. This was said by Brigadier General Sin in 1897. 1897, 123 years later, if my math is correct today. Absolutely true today. The first person to arrive and apply a bandage it affects the outcome of these patients. Whether they go into shock, irreversible shock, whether they live or die, the first person to apply a bandage could be as simple as a hand and direct pressure. The first person has a huge impact on the outcome of these patients. We believe that it is your officers who often can be that first person. So the course of action for this public education program specific to bleeding control and CPR, or CPR access is my training staff uh, will train your training staff to build up the overall team component of the training uh, cadre. You have 20 officers dedicated to your full-time training staff, and so we want to be sure uh, to boost their confidence, boost their abilities, to, to help, uh, help us help you teach your department. We'll start by also teaching 100% of the recruits in the academy. Uh, you typically do academies twice a year, and uh, we look, uh, we've spoken with your training division, and it averages about 40 candidates uh, per class, and so uh, there's 60, about 10% of your overall um, agency right there. Next, you have a great program where you do 18 offerings of a week-long in-service, and so the officers pick, uh, they don't have to go five days in a row, uh, they'll pick day one this week, day two, random week and day three. And so the training division has actually offered up an entire day for us for medical training. <laughs> so we want to inco uh, incorporate the Stop the Bleed, CPR, along with some other um, nationally known courses uh, and medical treatments uh, to provide a, a truly different perspective, uh, keep them engaged in the class and something that they, uh, they're not used to receiving. Uh, 20 years of the same type of continuing education for myself very monotonous and something not uh, that 
we don't look forward to. But when you can bring in outside uh, partners, teach new skills, it, it'll help with morale overall. We'll incorporate the, the local fire department. We want to do some pit crew type training for CPR. Uh, how do uh, they, how, in their experience on developing patients, you know, traumatically injured, just more of a, of a you know, civil service to civil service type relationship, uh, great bonds formed uh, among the men and women of, of each of the departments. And so let them show uh, how the fire department works with EMS on trauma scenes and the, the, get the officers uh, to see that. We, uh, we have a grant writer, uh, as does your department, and so we want them to start teaming up together, looking for grants that are out there for uh, uh, IFACs, individual first aid kits, that include trauma, pressure bandages, chest seals, uh, again, to be used on the officers themselves and the public. Uh, grant writers can, uh, will look also for training dollars to uh, offset both departments' budgets for this, as well as uh, AEDs that we'll talk about a little bit later. We'll do a lot of research. This program will be very heavy, heavy into research. Every case will receive 100% quality review. So we're looking for the good, the bad, the indifferent. Opportunities for improvement, if you will. To be able to pat men and women on the back, job well done, but also to listen to them, for them to tell us this worked, this didn't work. The class, you said this, but this is how it really worked. Uh, the tourniquet, I, didn't, I only had one tourniquet and that wasn't enough. Tourniquets uh, are this. We didn't. We did, we weren't provided enough training. So each each uh, simple survey will give us uh, data to extract, and that simple survey will also be the method that they'll receive their restock. So we'll coordinate with uh, that to, for the department to get their restock for tourniquets. We we want uh, every officer uh, when they uh, use a tourniquet to uh, fill this simple survey out. Very few questions. Uh, return it to their desk sergeant and for that desk sergeant to exchange them a tourniquet. Near immediately, ideally, because you never know when the next one's going to happen. And then uh, from the research we pro that's provided, that will uh, offer changes to the class that we may have to have. Although the Stop to Bleed class is a national um, uh, or an endorsed curriculum, if you will, we can absolutely make changes to how we teach it, maybe not the content, offer suggestions up to the American College of Surgeons, but we, we can tweak it a little bit to fit uh, the, the members and, and their feedback. So our detailed planning course of action, as you can see here, we want to execute the successful completion of Stop the Bleed, as already uh, mentioned, uh, the American Heart Association Basic Life Course, or CPR, if you will. And um, with that, uh, we'll, we'll roll into the Training Academy. Again, a little repetition here. And um, utilizing the training staff to boost our uh, ability to, to, to not miss a, any weeks of class, if you will. Uh, it'll truly be a partnership. We'll be the, the subject matter expert, if you will, there um, teaching, but also we feel it's a very important that the word also comes from the fellow officer. We, we understand the bond that fellow officers have, and we, we want the training division promoting this as much as, as much as anybody, if not more than anybody. How do we plan for the future of this program? You know, it's worth it now, but, but what about the future? We talked about it already, data, data, data. The data shall set you free. I'm a firm believer in that. Studying that 100% review um, throughout the duration of this program is paramount. Um, not only will we utilize the survey for our data, we'll also utilize feedback from the officer from the survey from the treating EMS agency, our staff, and to the emergency departments and surgical staffs that the hospital, that the patients are delivered to. We want to know the feedback. Are we over triaging these patients? Are we using tourniquets too much for simply or for simple lacerations that not are not arterial that are just oozing blood uh, or various things? So we want that feedback to go up to the surgeon and down from the surgeon to the, to the, uh, to the officer. So we want the, to be able to have loop closure. We want the feedback to, to ebb and flow. We feel that is this data that's gonna truly give us the return on investment, to be able to have tangible evidence that this program is making a difference. So what now, what then what? What does that mean? So we're in the now. So we talked about already point of injury care is following military medicine. 
up until uh, the, the war and terror started, EMS, we were uh, practicing Vietnam era medicine. Tourniquets were bad, evil, other things. Fill them up with, with IV fluids, saline. Um, so things have dramatically changed in the last uh, 18 years since uh, the war on terror started. So now tourniquets are good. Tactical uh, combat casualty uh, care is a military course that uh, corpsmen, medics, uh, and PJs are using uh, to treat military medicine. It's trickled down to the civilian side. And there's a little tweak to that class that's called tactical emergency critical care or uh, casualty care that is more specific to the, to the civilian sector. And our goal is to move into that course for your law enforcement officers as well. Uh, that, that focuses more on what we see on the civilian side, pediatrics, geriatrics, whatnot, and not just healthy, fit men and women in the battlefield. So, point of injury care is very new. That's the now. We want to start doing that. Very uh, dramatic, I would call it, statistic that we found during research for this program was done by Dr. Uh, Dr. Holcomb, who is a fellow Arkansan, uh, done his residency at, here in Little Rock at, at UMS. He and his partner said that potentially preventable deaths occur in 90% of hemorrhage patients, and they die before they make it to the hospital. Now, those, so it, it's kind of, it's, it's an interesting stat. So 90% of preventable deaths are from hemorrhage that do, and they die before they make it to the hospital. So what if your officers could get on scene and provide that tourniquet and that damage control? What would that look like? What do you think it would do to that number? I think if you looked at the, the statistics out of the war, it would drastically change that. 96% survival rate in the Iraq and Afghanistan war. 96 percent survival whereas, whereas in the civilian sector 90 percent fatality rate when they of those that don't make it to the hospital with the pulse now what so we want to train the officers and stop the bleeding cpr we want to start including the officers dispatch to to cases 911 calls where it sounds like there may be an external hemorrhage we want them going on these even if it's uh, obviously, they're going to be dispatched on the shootings and the stabbings, but what about the, the, the person who's had a home, a home woodworking accident or a lawnmower accident? Typically, officers don't go to those, yet the patients are there uh, hemorrhaging out and, and uh, could have irreversible damage. We want to go into that. We want, truly want a team concept for a hemorrhage type 911 request. We want to expect that LRPD may respond for cardiac arrest patients due to medical. Now, we're not talking about that a lot in this presentation. That is for our next one that will come, that will uh, expound upon this a little bit. But early CPR and early defibrillation is key to survival for cardiac arrest patients. Now, we say LRPD may respond for medical cases. Not always. We absolutely understand that the police officers have a job to do and a system to run, right? They, they can't go to medical cases just because there's a medical case, right? That's police, that's uh, EMS and fire's job, right? But what if they could? What if the system truly allowed them to respond to cardiac arrest patients and they have the training to do CPR and they have an AED from this program? Early CPR, hands-only CPR, and early defibrillation. That is the key to survival for cardiac arrest patients. Don't forget that. Very important. Then what? Again, back to the data. We're going to utilize the, the, the surveys that we've done instantaneously, a weekly quality assurance review. We'll present this data quarterly to various components of it and make the changes as needed. There's no sense in waiting a year at the end of the year to collect everything, aggregate the data, make the changes then. Let's make the changes as it goes along. We want to be make sure that we're all promoting the program, patting the officers on the back, doing press releases on, on, on the good news story, right? Now more than ever, unfortunately, law enforcement needs good, good news stories more than ever. So let's, let's show the community that you're out there doing more than, than what they assume the, you know, a police officer's job is just writing tickets and car accident investigations, murder investigations. There's so much more that the officers can be doing. And now, um, 
we want to publish the program information that what we study and what we find in, in uh, peer-reviewed journals, um, no, local and state newspapers uh, on the news. We want to be recognized as the nation's leader in this in this type of partnership, public-private partnership. We want what we're doing here to become a best practice and what, what we call the standard of care in the medical world. That's, that's key when, when you are considered the standard of care for an industry. As we do evaluation of the program, is it relevant? I would say so. Life preservation, property preservation, right? So on your, on your city seal, on your department's uh, vision statement, mission statement, we want to preserve life. We can preserve life by controlling hemorrhages, Performing CPR. Now, this is an interesting slide I want to show you. The, the first data point that you see here, the, the teal as I would call it, that's the 90% death rate that Dr. Holcomb mentioned. So 90% of these patients die uh, because they don't make it to the hospital with the pulse. They have bled out, right? So let's say if we change things. The red here is the, as we start training your agency, as we start training the Little Rock Police Department, the numbers, it's a slow increase until we can get up to 100% September. It'll take us a good nine months, uh, if not more possibly, to get to 100%. But you can see as we train these men and women to perform these things, and as they become more comfortable doing it, we project that the death rate will go down. So preventable deaths, 90%. Preventable deaths, 0%. They, they intersect, and that's what we wanna see. We wanna see our zero preventable death rate in Arkansas. In Little Rock, Arkansas, we wanna have zero preventable deaths because we're unconventional. We're thinking outside the box, and we are truly working as a team here with public service, police, fire, and EMS. So what we're gonna do is very effective. Efficiency, the more we do it, the more efficient we'll be at it, right? That's with anything. The more you do it, the more efficient you become. These are perishable skills, so the annual, it'll be an annual refresher in their classes, but the more you do it, the more you see it, uh, the more efficient you come in. Sustainability. Yeah, you know, you may be asking yourself, can we can we do this and, and keep doing it? You know, it's it, it would be a shame to implement this year one and not be able to continue. What what about those citizens who get injured next year? It's absolutely sustainable. So we truly feel just from what how we work with law enforcement, how we work with each other, even in, in skills performed, that by allowing this training to take place by allowing these skills to happen it's going to increase the morale of your department the men and women um, you know in the 20 plus years I've been a paramedic I've seen countless times officers wanting to help getting muddy and bloody and whatever if they want to help they just didn't know what to do so by allowing them to help it's some it's a mental psyche thing they know they've done what they can to help this man, woman, or child survive. And now they will be able to truly help them survive. Sustainability by partnering with area hospitals. Uh, tourniquets are expensive, I'll not lie to you, about $27 a piece. Uh, again, we'll be searching for grant dollars, but the area hospitals are ready to, they, they're bought into this proposal already. They want to assist both our agency and yours with tourniquet replenishment possibly other IFAC items. So very helpful with the sustainability. And then accidents continue to happen. Even if the crime rate goes down, there's, there's little to no violent crime. We still have hobbies and we still have accidents. Uh, external hemorrhages are still going to happen. And so it's our job to keep the men and women trained in it uh, so we can uh, help, uh, help them at their home or work. So in closing, few recommendations if I may I think it's um, we need to implement this program near immediately uh, the resources are available our staff is, is available and ready uh, training staff at your agency is available and ready so 
near uh, immediate implement patience, patience for all of us, um, but especially for you. It's going to take some time to see tangible results. Uh, there, there may be there may be months before the first officer has an opportunity to apply a tourniquet. It may be a couple of years before the time is right for an officer to be able to respond to a cardiac arrest patient. We have to have patience. And just because it, it may be slow to have an executed case doesn't mean the program is invaluable. Um, you gotta think about it. We spend more time not at work than we do at work, hopefully. So these skills can be done everywhere. And so we need to include that data uh, as feedback back to, to all of us that we know the, the, the program can work and does work. Um, and I also would, would, would like to say that um, we, we have to keep the officer's mental health at, at, at mind here. <coughs> Excuse me. So when, when you're covered in another person's blood, however little, however a lot, it can do something uh, to your psyche a little bit. And so to be able to follow up immediately with the officers as they've treated these patients or subjects as, as they may call them, patients for us, uh, but immediately a follow up and then probably a follow up a, later, a year later, or not a year, but at, at some time later. Uh, how are they doing from this? You know, do they, you guys have an EAP, the Employee Assistance Program? Um, do they have, if we can glean any information, you know, have they sought counseling help? Do we need to offer counseling help? So just to keep their mental health uh, at the forefront, that is something we, generally do not do a good job of in the EMS sector. I'll, I'll be very honest with you there. And uh, I also recommend that this just continue, uh, continue to expand our relationships among the agencies. So in closing, I would say, is it cutting edge? Absolutely it is. Leading the way. We want to lead the nation in this partnership. Results are tangible. You'll feel them. You'll see them. You'll feel the, the morale go up of your agency by them being able to do more than just be a police officer, if you will. Little to no cost to the, to the agency. We, uh, this agency is providing all of the training staff to train the trainers. We'll provide the, tra the staff, additional staff at the classes, all at our cost. We're providing the tourniquets at our cost. Again, uh, partnering for grants, but even if we don't get them, we are dedicated to provide this for your agency. We would use the tourniquets anyway, correct? So the investment is there. We're in it to support you and your, your men and women. So that concludes the report. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, thank you for your support.